Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Audio Podcast. This is going to be the first of a few episodes where I talk to you viewers. And one person that I've been wanting to talk to for a long time has been a long supporter of this channel. His name is Evan. He's in the Discord. I'm going to leave a link to that down below. Evan, how are you doing today? I'm doing pretty well, yeah. I mean, the day's finished uh, this side of the world, so uh, about to begin a new one in about 20 minutes. So other than that, I'm feeling okay. I hope to continue this mood on to the next day. Yeah, I I always find that very interesting that a lot of the people that kind of watch this channel are either from Australia or they're from the UK. So whenever I have just conversations, whether it's through text or through this, it feels like we're on totally different planes, obviously, because of the time zones we are. But I I think it's pretty cool that you're up staying up to do this with me tonight and you know something that you know we we were trying to do for a little bit here finally able to do it so i'm excited to do it yeah it's a pleasure absolutely and obviously i appreciate and i just wanted to say thank you for you know all the support that you've given over the while and uh yeah we can talk about some of the other stuff after but i wanted to start here because one thing that we immediately had in common i think it might be one of the reasons that you started to watch the channel Tell me about one of your guitars, your favorite one. My favorite one? Well, it's like choosing a favorite child. And uh, to be honest, I've um, I've had my three electrics for about 18 months. You know, I'm a fairly new newcomer to the electric guitar world. So, um, okay. but I guess it would be the, uh, the one that you have in mind is probably the Troublemaker Telecaster, the MIJ 2020 Troublemaker Tele in Arctic White. So why did you go towards that guitar? And were there any other guitars that you were looking at at the time? Well, to be honest, um, uh, let's start, uh, let's go a bit further back and just uh, trace my journey to the electric guitar. So uh, my wife's uh, father, so my father-in-law, he is a, uh, he's a jazz guitarist. And, uh, you know, when when um, he f- found out that, uh, you know, when I was going out with his daughter and now my wife, uh, f- when he found out that I could play guitar, he said, well, you know, I played a bit of acoustic, you know, just rhythm, basically, a b- bit of scale work that I picked up here and there, but mostly mostly rhythm, mostly chords, um, some bar chords, campfire chords, that kind of thing. He said, you, you should play electric. And I thought to myself, well, you know, um, I mean, the reason why I play guitar in the first place was to play electric guitar. I wanted to be Jimi Hendrix when I was 12 because he just looked so cool. Um, of course, my parents at the time just bought me one of the other nylon string classicals. So I just learned on that. And then I just gave up my teenage rock and roll dreams uh, when I <laughs> graduated from high school and started university, only to come back to it now in my late 30s. And I walked into the shop one day and, of course, I knew... I wanted a Telecaster because, God, that's what Springsteen was playing. It's what uh, Jeff Buckley played, Joe Strummer, whatever, some of my idols. Johnny Marr of the Smiths you know, played a Telecaster on uh, This Charming Man. And I thought, well, you know, Jimi Hendrix played a Strat, but the Telecaster seems to have a bit of mojo. So let me let me go grab that. I mean, what, what would I know about uh, the number of pickups it has or what it can or can't do? So... Went into the shop and uh, the guy said, oh, this has just come in. You know, it's a troublemaker telly and it looks a bit like a Les Paul. And he said, yeah, but it sounds like a like a telly. Yeah, give it a go. And I thought, well, it, I think it was down to comfort. You know, there was that and there was a Ventura modified. And I don't know, just the troublemaker felt, a bit, felt more comfortable. And the humbucking pickups just sounded really nice. And I thought, well, you know, let's give this a go. And I bought it and... Um, then I thought, this is great, but, you know, I'm going to need a single coil <laughs> Telecaster as well. And I think it was thanks to you. Thanks again to the Audiomo podcast for, or <laughs> channel rather for inspiring my second purchase of a um, MIJ, uh, what is it, hybrid 50s. And then the end of last year, the hybrid 60s Stratocaster as well. So those, that's my guitar trio. And I promised my wife that there won't be another electric for a decade at least. A decade? You really Who made knows? that commitment? You know, but, but you know what? At the end of the day here, there's yeah. nothing you can't do with those three guitars. No, not at all. And uh, they, each have their, they each have their use. 
and um, I'm really glad, you know, uh, that I've I've got those three. And um, yeah, they're they're a nice bunch. And the and you know the troublemaker is still probably my favourite, to be honest. Um, it's just got a, it's got a very special sound, you know. That uh, you know it was the first. So I guess it's the one that I find myself going back to. I mean, the others are great, you know, but uh, that one. I don't know. There's a little, little magic, something magical about it. I think it's the neck, too, on that yeah. specific guitar, because it, it's a mahogany neck, so it feels it a little bit heavier. When you play the other two Japanese guitars next to it, you might not notice it as much, but it really, it's, like, it's really got its own thing. It feels really modern, but the bridge pickup just screams Telecaster when you pick it up. Oh, yeah. I'm like, is, this is a humbucker? Like, how? This doesn't make any sense, especially with oh, the, the bridge, but yeah, it sounds great. Yeah. The middle position is really twangy, you know. That's mm-hmm. Telecaster, you know. It's not. It's got a good bit of jangle to it. So yeah, I mean, not complaining. I just, you know, wanted to complete the set. <laughs> and um, yeah, and uh, well, I think I've got <laughs> everything going. Um, I've still got my two acoustics that I learnt on. Um, and I'm not exactly a Martin or Gibson. Um, I think one's one's a Yamaha. The others are washburn, so good, good guitars to learn on. But one of these days, I'll get myself a a nice, relatively high level acoustic. So um, I, again, I've been promised for my fortieth birthday that I'll that I'll be getting one. So, How long do you have till that goes? Just under a year. <laughs> uh, we're like the same age, yeah. But I, my wife and I were already talking about that too a little bit. I mean, I, I'm not kind of the person to to think of when I have a birthday, it normally goes really poorly. Like nothing ever goes right that day. We don't really like holidays in this house for whatever reason. It's just, it gets built up and then it's, it's not so good. I respect the little one because you'll learn this too. It's a, it's a variable that you really have no control over. So we don't look at birthdays the way, you know, when I was younger, obviously you looked at things a lot differently, but I was thinking, you know, I was like, for the 40th, maybe I'll go somewhere, like a factory, and pick something out, like, off the actual production line, something like that. would be pretty cool, but I don't know. It's just, it's crazy to think that we're getting that old, because we don't look that old. Like, you don't look that old. You look you look young 30s just like I do. I, some people tell me I look like I'm, I'm still, you know, in my 20s, which is whatever, but it's, it's, it's just crazy how fast it goes. I don't have a lot more hair in my 20s, though. <laughs> Well, Skype is helping you out right now. So it's not like it's anything egregiously balding. Yeah. You're doing okay. You're doing okay Thank is you. the moral of the yeah. story. So yeah. you have these three guitars. And what do you use to actually play through as far as an amp goes? Okay. It's um, a bit of an uncool choice. Just a small uh, you know, rolling cube uh, practice amp at this stage. Which, uh, you know, suits me fine given where we live. It's probably not the right sort of environment here to house a house a tube amp or anything like that. No. Um, I mean, even you know, some of the tube amps that I've played in the, sh- in the store, even if I bring them down to two watts, I mean, they still have this presence that can still make the walls, you know, vibrate. You know, so probably, you know, upset the little old lady next door. So, um yeah, so I think that'll that'll suit now. You know, it's a modeling amp. It's got some it's got some features which uh, sort of get me close to the sound of I don't know a jazz chorus or a black panel you know Fender amp or whatever. Just you know they get me in that sort of ballpark. You know, for the little bit of practice that I do. You know, probably you know if I decide to go look out and busk, perhaps you know. <laughs> If I need to make a bit of extra cash that way, I mean, it'll probably uh, uh, suit then too. But um, no, look, you know, I think uh, we were talking about the Tremlord, weren't we? If I were to get something like that, you know, we'd be in a have to be in a much bigger place than we are now. You'd have to be in a state to be able to play a Tremlord at the right volume. That's a very loud amp. It's a great amp, but it is a very, very loud amp. That's what I'm but saying. I- it's got. It's got the two. It's got the two watt uh, setting. I think you can bring it down to one watt. But even then, even then, it was it was loud. It was loud. <laughs> and um, yeah, when it uh, when it broke up, it was yeah. Look, uh, I couldn't get away with playing this. You know, where no, it, we are. It's difficult. It's difficult. Yeah. Honestly, you need something under a watt. 
And the only amp I could think of that's at a reasonable price, that's a valve amp, um, yep. would be the Vox, the AC4, because that one goes down to a quarter of a watt. Oh, it's yeah. only a four watt amp to start with. So something like that would be okay. But I mean, I like the cube. I think the cube is one of the best modeling amps out there. I would rather have the cube than pretty much any of the line six products. The only ones that I like as much as the cube would be uh, the katanas. But again, most of those are pretty big. So you'd still be pushing a little bit as far as the, the overall volume goes. But hey, if we go out gigging, you know, a katana might be a worthwhile purchase, but uh, I don't know. I've got to get good before <laughs> before I go out gigging or doing anything serious like that. So, yeah, I'm I'm still very much uh, in my education as a as as a guitarist, or at least as a as a lead guitarist right now. So, have you played in any bands before this? No, no, nope, just solo. Uh, my big in my late high school years, I liked folk folk music. So acoustic mm. picking, so solo, and you you know you play for friends and you play on on camps or whatever, or uh, that's you know. And as I've been a teacher, I've brought one of my acoustic guitars into class, you know, and just played the kids a stupid song and um, given them a, little, a bit of a concert. That's that's as far as I've gone, <laughs> you know, at this stage. No, that's good, yeah. though. I, I mean, in the future here, in an ideal world, the little one grows up a little bit and you have some free time. Mm. Is it something that you would like to to go with as far as playing with a full band? And if you were to do that, would you want to be playing, you know, original music or would you be happy just playing songs that everybody likes and keeping it simple like that? Maybe a little bit of both. You know, I've actually, you know, as you probably know, I've gotten into some songwriting. I did try my hand at it while at school, you know, at, at high school. So, um you know, stuff that makes me feel quite embarrassed now, but uh, you know, I've written a couple, couple songs and a few sketches over the last year. Um, you know, and recorded myself using um, GarageBand, that kind of software. And um, yeah, so just uh, as I'm learning, I'm, you know, finding, you know, you know, checking out some chord progressions, you know, seeing which uh, which scale, you know, major, minor, pentatonic goes over that. And I think, oh, that sounds like a nice vocal line. Maybe I should put some words to it. And, um, yep, yeah, but that's, that's how I've written uh, the couple songs that I've done, the, 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 the two songs that I feel proud enough of to say, hey, I've done that. <laughs> you know? yeah. And it's funny, all you need is the pentatonic scale if you know yeah. it up and down the neck. You could get away with everything. You don't need to use more than that. There are some of the best guitar players in the world, like Mateus Asado is is amazing. I love listening to him play. And he does use some complicated phrasings as far as his chord work goes. But if you actually break down what he's playing with his solos, it's it's yeah. 90% of the time just pentatonics. Mm. Yeah, you know, what I've been listening to a lot lately is the uh, Beano album, the John Mayle Blues Breakers mm -hmm. album. Um, you know, I'm, I wouldn't necessarily consider myself the biggest Eric Clapton fan, although, you know, the Unplugged album was a big part of the household listening in the 90s. I think everyone owned that album, the, the one with yeah. Tears in Heaven that won all the Grammys. And um, no, but recently I've started listening to music as a guitar player rather than as a music fan. So I've sort of been going to some of those foundational records like the Beano album. And I thought to myself, bloody hell, this is great. You know, why didn't I discover this earlier? And, you know, a lot of his, you know, Clapton's playing there. It's very, it's quite raw. But, you know, it's cause since I know the pentatonics, I'm or at least getting a, getting a feel for them. I can see what he's doing. You know, and I think to myself, you know, these, you know, he, this is impressive stuff. And this is probably where it began in so far as blues rock guitar playing, um, you know, started. Maybe not the blues, of course, that happened a bit earlier, but, you know, that blues rock, especially that British blues rock playing, you mm -hmm. know, and I thought to myself, OK, this is this is the the wellspring from which, you know, a lot of the later artists uh, emerged Um and just real, a real fascinating education, just that album. Um, yeah, so talking about the pentatonic, I'm just uh, that's that's something that, um, that that you can hear Clapton doing a lot, a lot of the minor pentatonic scales, mm -hmm. um, B B minor. Um, yeah, so tr training my ear as well. Yeah. I get it. So you say, yeah. you say you obviously you really like Eric Clapton. Have you gone back 
to stuff before as far as other bands he worked with. Have you ever listened to the Yardbirds or Derek and the Dominoes or, you know, I, obviously I'm, I'm assuming you've heard Cream, but the other oh, yeah, two. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the other two are the ones that Derek a lot of people Derek don't the know. Derek and Dominoes, uh, you know, Layla, you know, what a, mostly from the radio and whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, Yardbirds, the odd song here and there, but I think, uh, I don't know if Clapton played on them because they, they ran through a few guitars. Like Jimmy Page was a member, wasn't he? Yes. Yeah. That was a strange thing. band because of how yeah. many people ended up becoming gigantic outside of that band. It was like, like a revol- revolving door of legends. You know? Yes. I yeah. believe Jeff Beck as well. And that's yeah. just, it's, it's crazy to think about now. It's just like, wait, you had all these people in one band. How did that work? Well, Clapton played the bass, I believe, on a few of those tracks because he had to make way for the other guitar players. So it just tells you the quality of guitarist in the room, I suppose, when you're, you're sitting in your jam with people that, that are that good. But that, that, that's awesome. If you had to pick one favorite Clapton song, what would it be? Good. Um, a Captain Original song? Yes. Ooh. Um, that's a tricky one. Uh, solo or, or with a band at all? Doesn't matter. Okay, well, I don't know. The Cream song, White Room, I've always loved. And I think, uh, yeah, just that wah-wah sound there. I think he's also a pioneer of that, of, of that style. Yeah. I don't know. I've always liked that song, and that's probably more more Jack Bruce sort of song. Cause he 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 sings vocals, and it's um, "Sunshine of Your Love." I like as well, and I guess that can be considered Clapton. You know, they, they that vocal tag team there. I guess as a as a music fan. Oh, and, and and I learned how to play "Sunshine of Your Love" before I even knew what a pentatonic scale was. You know, yes. The guitar tutor said, "Yeah, do this do 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 do." You know. <laughs> Yeah, it's it. The one thing about there. yeah, so the one thing about those old blues songs yeah. is it's hard to tell who the original writer really was for a oh, lot yeah, of them. Especially Led Zeppelin, yeah. Oh, when they yeah. Court, the Le- court cases later on. Yeah, they. they, they yeah. If this was the modern day and time, I I don't know that they would be as revered if they had pulled the same things. I mean, great, great band. A lot of them were, you know, immensely talented and you can say whatever you want about whether you like that style of music or, you know, they're kind of off the stage antics, so to speak. I'll put that lightly, but a lot of those songs were, were lifted songs. And when I think of Clapton, I, 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 my favorite one from him is a song. I'm not even a hundred percent positive he wrote, which is bell bottom blues. But I love the intro to White White Room at White House. It's 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 um it it just has this like ominous feeling leading into it between kind of that that that, that synth of the organ whatever it's that, that's going along with the guitar and then it just riffs right into it. It's like oh it's awesome. Yeah, no, it is. It has that very ominous um, psychedelic. But uh, I think there's a cello in there too, which Jack Bruce played. Um, yeah, almost uh, orchestral, almost Eastern sounding, and then come the lyrics, and it—I um, don't know—it's it's very evocative, you know. And I—I I like uh, I, I like li- lyrics that take you places, that that paint paint a picture, that paint a scene. Um, yeah, I always appreciated songwriters who can who can really do that, who can tell a story and and evoke a sense of place and really a- appeal to the senses that way. I think that makes sense then based on what you've said for your preferences. You were talking about yeah. some other guitar players. You mentioned Joe Strummer. I like yeah. Joe Strummer a lot. And you also mentioned Johnny Marr. I also yeah. love Johnny Marr. As you can tell, I, I'm a big Jaguar guy personally. Yeah, yeah. But um, I, I, one thing that they share in common here, um, a, a lot of kind of earlier Marr stuff specifically, and, and most of Joe's drummers in general here for, throughout yeah. the span of his career when he was you know alive, um, it was so well written as far as the song writings themselves. And, you know, obviously uh, Marr wasn't the one singing, it was Morrissey, but yeah. you could tell like the way he approached the songwriting, it was never overtly like difficult, but it did such a good job of evoking a mood and an emotion without having to do stuff like that. And obviously Strummer was the same way because none of that's super difficult or technical to play, but it really, no. it hits the important parts. And that's something I feel like is kind of getting a little bit lost 
these days where it's like you're always trying to one up something or add something in or add some sort of production trick to to make it stand out. But at the end of the day, like I, I, I'm with you, like I like these simple kind of things that can really just hit the raw emotions that we have and why we connect with these artists. No, absolutely. And I'm just trying to think of, um, I guess, other guitarists. I mean, people who can actually evoke those those um those same those emotions perhaps without even using words people like mm -hmm. uh uh roy buchanan um yeah. you know his uh, i mean you're a gary moore fan so um you know gary moore's done a few roy buchanan songs is that one of his what's it called um the messiah will come again yes and there's oh, i tell you um the, the minute I saw that, uh, I knew nothing about this guy. It was just someone, something on an internet forum, maybe on Facebook, just posted this live video of this guy with a, you know, newsboy cap and a battered Stratocaster, sorry, Telecaster. And he, you know, does this little spoken word thing at the beginning. And then he just, like, makes his guitar cry. You know, and I think someone in the YouTube comments said that he makes his guitar cry tears of blood. And... Yeah, I thought to myself, that's exactly what he's doing. You know, I mean, I haven't really heard that sound coming from a guitar. It's like he's and, and he uses the uh, I think his pinky finger to on the volume to to make these notes swell. And uh, yes. I thought, God, such such simple. I mean, you know, I wouldn't call his tech. It's it's it, it, it's not a um, it's not a song full of pyrotechnics. In fact, he's he's playing a few simple notes. But he's just getting so much out of them, you know. He's wringing so much passion out of these, out of these, um, these few notes. Well, and that's why I feel like, what, like, what. Speaking of Roy Buchanan and Gary Moore too, yeah. you can't mention those two without mentioning Peter Green, who's oh, also a master of that as well. And when you're talking about these subtle techniques, you know, I also I think about Jeff Jeff Beck. Because Jeff Beck has a lot of things that he was kind of the the innovator, so to speak, of. Who knows who actually he might have picked it up for. Maybe he really did just come up with these kind of styles on their own of just how to approach the instrument outside of just what you're playing with the chords. Just those little things with the volume knobs and little things yeah. with how you use the vibrato or tremolo system. I and, and Robin Ford is another player that is so great at using little phrases but really hitting you with them. It's it's not it's not pyrotechnics, that's a really good way of putting it, that yeah. it's not slapping you in the face, but it's just so overwhelming and powerful at the same time. Yeah, I mean, you know, someone like Hendrix can bring the house down, mm -hmm. you know, uh, whatever, at uh, Woodstock or whatever, um, you know, and it's, um, and that's great, you know, that that's Hendrix, he's got that flamboyant style, it's just part of who he is. Yet uh, Roy Buchanan, I mean, you, you you see this live video of him, and I think he's playing the solo, and then he goes and he walks behind the amp and continues playing. Very unassuming, uh, obviously, and I wasn't a big fan of being the center of attention, and yet he's, he, he kills it, you know, and he has the audience in the palm of his hand, you know. Um, just uh, utterly, you know, all my respect, you know, and I respect. You know, for an artist, you know, obviously with a lot of conviction and a lot of uh, confidence in their in their own performance and their own art um, is, is something that um, that I can appreciate and uh, maybe I don't know, aspire to. You know, well, I think it's better I to aspire to be something like that. And yeah. this is something that is I think we're in a very unique situation in this time that we live in right now because everyone wants to – well, well, not everyone wants to. The, the most accessible way to share how you play a guitar or a drum kit or whatever your instrument of choice is is in very condensed forms. A lot of people, even when it comes to listening to a full album, they won't listen to an album in order. It's all about singles and that. But that that's not that different. What's really different is to show yourself playing. Like if you just wanted to play a clip, you have what's the longest you can upload to Instagram? 60 seconds? Mm -hmm. So what ends up happening is everybody gets so competitive that they kind of ignore – 
those the, the, those baseline techniques and like the really the slow stuff, you know, the, the boring stuff, so to speak. And they kind of focus on their technique getting to such a high level where it's it's so flashy because they feel like that's the best way of going about it so that the most people will see me. I have to show that I'm the best, like I'm a, more of an Eddie Van Halen or a Satriani type than, uh, you know, a Buchanan or a Robin Ford. That that seems much less popular, so to speak. And I don't know. Maybe maybe we're just the last of this generation, I, I, or, or the, our generation is the last of its kind in that sense. Where yeah. I feel like we still we're a little bit different in how we 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 view and approach things like that. No, absolutely. Look, I um, you know, I get the algorithm on on YouTube. I get uh, recommended short snippets of people giving bravura performances of of uh, I don't know solos or yeah, this is me doing. Um, Mark Knopfler, uh, lady writer, you know, which is oh, great, you know, it's it's admirable, you know, I, I wish I could do it like that right now. But again, it just goes to show what a short attention span we have these days is that we are looking, that, that we're not patient enough to sit through the less flashy material, you know, before we get to the stuff that would wow us. You know, I think there's a lot to be said for you know, waiting for like a song or a piece of music to develop. And actually, because uh, sometimes it's it's in, that, in those spaces between, you know, that uh, y- you let the music breathe, you know, and, and, and you can actually appreciate the subtlety of, of what a composer or, or what an instrumentalist is doing. Um, and I think we're losing that. And, and, and not just in, in, in music, but I think, you know, I th- I saw it written down somewhere that apparently these days the average um, person living, was it in uh, North America or, or England, I can't remember, has like the attention span of or, or has a shorter attention span than a goldfish. I don't know whether that was, high, you know, an exaggeration or not all hyperbole, but it wouldn't shock me given, you know, the amount of information we're inundated with uh you know, day after day on social media and these short clips and these short videos and uh, status updates and tweets and whatever else. This is that we no longer seem to have the patience or even the time maybe to actually sit down and appreciate uh, something that's long form. Um, and I mean, I love, I mean, in the pre social media days, you know, back when I, I used to do, do a, do a paper run in the mornings, I had a, a bloody, you know, CD disc man stuffed into my <laughs> into my pocket and in, into the pocket of my tracksuit pants. And, you know, I, I and back in those days, you know, this is before iPods even, you know, I listened to albums, an album from start to finish. You know, I'd, I'd even measure uh, how successful my my route was, <laughs> you know, my route um, uh, by whether I finished an album or not or how many albums I could listen to during it. And so what it was uh, White Stripes, uh, Nick Cave, Nick Cave, Nick Drake. A lot of my formative listening happened like that, just listening to an album from start to finish. And uh, I don't think I can't remember the last time I did that. Maybe on my way to work, you know, with the with the Beano album. Um, but uh, I just long for those days. And of course, life being so busy now, uh, sometimes you know I'm only able to listen to one one or two tracks. <laughs> That's funny you say that. That's really funny you say that because I was very similar like that. I had the Walkman, but I had I had to buy the one that was shockproof. And the reason for that was I would go snowboarding. And when 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 you're snowboarding, obviously it's it's in my backpack because I have to keep it warm and and away from you know any um, liquid to getting inside of it. So I would also time how well I was doing based on if I could beat it before the third or the fourth song that's coming up on this album. And then I would start the chairlift and listen to the rest of the album. And this became an ongoing process because the, 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 the rise to the top was about 15 minutes at the mountain I used to go to. So I would basically start restart the album at the top or swap it for a new one. And I would know if I was having a good run or not based on what song or where I was in that song when I got to the bottom. So that's that's pretty funny what you said about the paper route. And it's it's something to be said about not being able to skip, even if you wanted to, because in that situation, I'm not reaching into my backpack. I don't have a little phone Mm -hmm. where I can click instantly on a screen and go next song, next song, next song. No, you're going to sit through it. And that ends up being 
a very positive thing, I feel like, especially if you are a creative person, because when you say and you actually listen to something, it might not be your favorite song. You might pick something up from that song that you wouldn't have, you know, given the time of day because you might want to said, ah, you know, I, I'd rather go to this one instead right now because I prefer this song. And mm. I feel like that is another thing that's just being lost. And again, yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe it is the goldfish. Mm. I don't think that is hyperbole. No, you know, like a lot of people, um, like you think about some of the great albums of all time, um, things like Thriller and Fleetwood Mac's Rumors. Uh, I'm not a big fan of those albums. Uh, you're familiar with them, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. Because each each and every track sounds like it could be a single, and that was probably by design. I like the albums with, I wouldn't call them filler, but again, some of the, I guess you'd call them deep cuts now in today's language. Um, that again, um, those tracks between the singles, you know, I, I like the spaces like in, in between a single piece of music, they're the spaces between. Sometimes a good album needs, um, just like a good book needs, you shouldn't, it doesn't need to be action packed from beginning to end. You know, you need those lulls, you need those subtler tracks, the ones that couldn't have been hits. Um, so you look at albums like, uh, I'm just trying to think of an example. Um, Music from the Big Pink by the band. Yeah. Again, I wouldn't. I wouldn't even say there are obvious singles there. I think the only obvious single there was The Weight. I don't even know if that was a single. But a very, you know, it's a gentle, very. It's an album for the patient listener. Let's put it that way. Um, what other albums were there um, that I could think of? Ones with uh, some obvious, uh, you know, like. Um, London Calling by The Clash is another one, which I think is probably the best double album ever released. Because I think in the CD era, a lot of people released double albums that were just packed with filler. Like I'm thinking, and this might make me unpopular, you know, Melancholy in the, in the Infinite Sadness by The Smashing Pumpkins? <laughs> yes. It's, it's, that's just overstuffed. I don't know. There's good, great songs there, but um, I don't know. There's just a lot of dross, you know, stuff, that, boring, plodding uh you know songs which come across maybe more as sketches than uh than as uh proper songs especially on the second album whereas in the vinyl era so a lot of double albums they kind of justified the space mm-hmm. taken so yeah like london calling especially and you know there are a few less obvious songs there um in between the singles um which uh, and um again the album the album as a, a as a single unit, I just miss listening to to a single album in that sense. Um, and I, I guess I'm rediscovering it now with the <laughs> with the uh, John Mayall album. But um, yeah, it's just uh, it's another reason why I don't really like listening to listening to compilations, unless it's a compilation of you know of rarities like B sides or whatever. Um, and that's also why I'm not a fan of uh, such a big fan of rumors or thriller, because they just sound like collections of singles. It's just one potential hit after the other. And that's nice. It's great. But, you know, you've heard these hits on the radio anyway, thousands of times. You know, rock radio, these are like staples or or pop radio for thriller. You know, it's um, something that uh, you, you, want, you, want a, you want a little more subtlety. I agree. And one of my favorite Gary Moore songs would fall into that kind of category as well, because Gary Moore obviously was known for being a a world class talent on the instrument itself. But there's a song called Parisian Walkways. Yeah, it's kind of in the middle in the middle of the album. But if you actually listen to the words, it's such a powerful song of just like he has this like remorse of just like just remembrance. And it's it's very nostalgic in a way. And It's not meant to be a signal. It was never meant to be a single. It's just it was something that he wanted to write. And you really can get that vibe from it. Whereas sometimes when you listen to a lot of the bigger productions and this isn't exclusive, as you as you um, alluded to here to newer music, but even like the Fleetwood Mac album, that album, it almost felt like I, I would love to have been a fly on the wall. To, during the actual tracking process of that to see where they were thinking like no we need to do this or this will make it more appealing or this that and the other because it almost feels like 
that it, that had to have been done to an extent to make some of the decisions that they made for the songs that they did. Or maybe they went in with way more songs and then the producer narrowed it down to no, each of one of these ones, we can make the most money if these are the ones that we pick. And then, you know, even though you might like this song better, we'll push this off to a side here and maybe we'll focus on that for a future kind of piece of work. I it it really is hard to say and I don't like I don't like typecasting entire generations of people because there are some people much younger than us that still feel the same way that we do but then there's people much older than us that might feel the opposite way they might want to hear an album that is only like rumors where every single song on it is oh I know this song or I know this song or this is great or this is a single or this that and the other and it's just it's a very interesting conversation and food for thought when you think of it like that I seem to I don't exactly remember now that I think about it, a hit album, which was, which had your obvious singles, but also quite a lot of maybe uh, stuff that wouldn't necessarily have a lot of pop appeal. I'm thinking, well, then again, I haven't listened to a lot of uh, recent music, so maybe I'm the wrong person to to talk like this. But I'm thinking, especially during the 80s, uh, Tracy Chapman's debut album, one of my all time favorites, Um, you know, uh, Fast Car, Baby. Uh, can I hold you? You know, th- those are the big radio songs um, talking about a revolution, you know, pop hits, you know, very. But the rest of it is very sort of sed- I wouldn't say not necessarily sedate, but definitely a lot more introspective singer songwriter, just one woman with an acoustic guitar with very minimal production. And that album sold millions of copies in the late 80s. And I thought to myself, God, these days are gone, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, obviously, there was uh, there was maybe a taste for that after Paul Simon's Graceland, or you know, if, uh, or um, what else came out in the late eighties? Um, no, that's all I can think of right now. I think Paul Simon's Graceland was the other big singer songwriter hit from that from that era. Mm-hmm. Uh, so maybe people were you know giving, and of course these days you have uh, I don't know your Ed Sheeran's and um, uh, George Ezra, whatever they you know. Um, you know, it's um, you know, it's it's catchy stuff, and it 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 sells records, and you know, people like them, you know, and uh, you know, being being a school teacher myself, you know, of course, I I have to deal with uh, with uh, with children who or or teenagers who who like this stuff, and uh, mm. then I tell them, no, in fact, uh, I like this, that, and the other, and they say. Oh, you like uh yeah, I could you've heard Nirvana and they go, Oh come on, that's like my grandpa's music and it's like oh geez, oh, I'm old. <laughs> oh no. That would that would bury me. That would bury me if if, yeah, if look, somebody in a younger generation said that. Well, you know, I've been teaching for fourteen years. Yeah. And uh, you know, when I first started teaching, I was in my mid twenties, not too much older than the than the seniors I was teaching. And th- there was less of a gap there, okay? than there is now. Now it feels like not just a genera it, it, it's it it is a generation gap, let's put it that way. It, it's it's a full fully fledged generation gap. Um I I found myself humming, you know, the, the song Rumors, the Stevie Next Fleetwood Mac song Room uh, um Dreams. You know that song Dreams? And uh someone said, Oh, you saw in that TikTok as well, haven't you, sir? And it's like Okay. <laughs> No, I think it's one of a guy on a skateboard, you know, uh, singing that song, and apparently it went viral. And and, and no, I think everyone under fifteen thinks that you know that's a that was an original composition for that particular TikTok, uh, and it's like, uh, well, that's their point of reference, you know. Mm-hmm. I guess like for, I guess for a lot of people, Wayne's World would have been their first, you know, exposure to Bohemian Rhapsody, so. Um, you know, and even now when people think about it, oh, it's the it's the head banging in the car song. <laughs> yeah. So I guess you know it, it's it's a generation thing. People people discover the oldies in their own time, and you know, um, and maybe there's you know we we roll our eyes at it now, and you know I do. I think God, I roll my eyes so many times a day. I uh, gotta probably know what the inside of my head looks like by now, <laughs> but it's um, you know. It's, yeah, I think that can probably do a lot worse than than Fleetwood Mac in that instance, at least. You could, you could, yeah. and you you got me to thinking here. I was trying to think of a modern, like a rock band yeah. who was popular, who had an album, 
that wasn't all meant to be big hits and that you could really tell there was a lot of, you know, they, it, it, they wanted to write it for the sake of writing it for no other purpose, really. And I, I, I have two that come to my mind. Let me know if you, if you could think of a third one here from the last, this sounds modern. This is again, how yeah. I know I'm old. This is from the late nineties, both of these albums, I believe um, the muse album, the origin of symmetry, that mm-hmm. album had, uh, plug in baby on it and a hyper music and songs that did get very popular but it also had a lot of songs that had they been a more popular band i'm not so sure if they would have made it onto the album and the second band i'm thinking of was is weezer uh, after oh, yeah. the blue album which was a very big success and that that obviously had its own kind of quirky songs on it as well but pinkerton that's like an album of quirky songs with like one single and i thought that that was the only instance i could think of where a band had that much heat so to speak where there was so much looking forward to the, to the second album and they kind of instead of leaning into the pop side which is you know the common thing to do in that aspect because you're like okay so we're popular now let's try and cater our songs songs to that style of music and that kind of um, audience, they kind of went in the other direction. They almost got a little bit more weird and a little bit more um, eccentric, so to speak. And I've always kind of admired that about them and their decisions for that album. And it's become a cult classic, but at the time, oh, right, people people rejected, rejected oh, that album. I remember. I was there. It was the end of uh, 96, I think it was. Yeah, the Blue Album was everywhere. I think it came out a couple years before. Everyone loved it, you know, Buddy Holly, the Sweater song, Say It Ain't So, you know, classic songs. Mm-hmm. And then Pinkerton comes the, the single, what is it, Al Scorcho, you know. Yep. Nice enough song, got some radio play. And then, yeah, the rest of the songs were weird. And <laughs> it was forgotten. And it was trashed in the press, I remember. Even, you know, oh, yeah. where, 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 I, where I was living, you know, my little small town newspaper gave it two stars out of five, saying, yeah, it's it's melodic, but it's odd. <laughs> So uh, forget this one. Put on the blue album again, and I think yeah, Rivers Como he uh, disowned it for a couple of years until you know it gathered some momentum online. I think through fan forums, and all of a sudden, yeah, now it's a classic that they're playing in its entirety in concerts every now and again. I think that speaks a lot to his character, and yeah. I I don't want to I don't want to bash the guy, but it's clear what his motivations were to begin with here, because if you take that. The, the Pinkerton out of the equation for a second. Say that yeah. it, it, it still it, it didn't get popular. Say that it did not become a cult classic. I don't believe he'd ever play any of those songs again. And as you can see, the evolution of that band and how they've gone on, mm. they had the Green album that came after that, which again was more much more similar to the Blue album than Pinkerton yeah. in many ways and in many structural ways. But after that, it seems like they've they've tried to keep adapting to what's currently the style of music and and, and the production tech techniques to try and stay um, relevant into, you know, the very, very popular scene of things. And I I find it very strange. It's like when I see somebody aged over 50 still writing songs that are very applicable to 17 and 18 year olds, like very applicable talking about like the prom dances and things of that nature. First dates. It's, it's something that makes me say, it's just like, are you writing this because you really feel this or are you writing this because you know it's an easy way in to get you on the radio again i i don't know and I, it makes me kind of it makes me kind of sad because maybe if if that band or not that whole band but maybe if rivers had a different philosophy here and he really didn't care what anybody thought we would have had more albums that were like pinkerton in the after the fact in, instead of going back to the other ones and there are some great ones i i think make believe is one of my favorite of their modern ones that that, that they made and you know obviously the green album is pretty good too but it's, it's it's very very it's one of those things we'll never get the answer to so i can only sit here and speculate but uh, i just i just wish more people especially once the people get famous that they would kind of stay true to they who they are but i suppose we're never going to be in that situation, so it's hard to sit here and judge. Yeah, look, it's very easy when you don't have the eyes of the world on you to mm-hmm. you know, stay stick to your guns and remain true to your own vision. Um, I don't know whether that applies too much to you, Jim, being the YouTube star you are. <laughs> I am nothing. <laughs> no? 
<laughs> no, I mean you. Though. And I think, and just you know, in 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 uh, as a segue, I think that's something that I really appreciate about the about the Audiomo channel is that uh, you are yourself, and you have created this community uh, of of fans that um, you know that that really do. Ap- appreciate uh, the, the fact that uh, you you present in the way you do that that you have your own integrity as a as a performer as a presenter as a as a host of this channel and it's always a pleasure to listen to well, I really appreciate that and it's funny yeah. to me because I never thought anyone would watch any of these videos part of it was a joke almost at first I was just yeah. like I was so bored because obviously we didn't have a whole lot to do given the circumstances. And I was like, oh, I'll just make some videos. I'll have some fun with it. And I don't know why. I, I, I mean, it makes sense now looking back. But at first when I was making these, I was like, I was like how, how is 100 people watching this? This means like why would anyone click this? And it just seems so foreign to me. But I think that I understand that. And again, I appreciate it. But because – the channels that I look at, obviously, I think they're much better guitar players than I am, the, the, the few guitar channels that I do watch. But I watch them not because of that. I watch them because it feels like it feels real and it feels like something that I identify with in the way that we were just talking about that older music where yeah. I, I can listen to the whole album. Like I want to know somebody's whole story. I don't you know, it's it's nice to hear you know, about new gear. It's nice to hear new gear and, and all of the expensive course. stuff. But somebody like Ask Zach is is an amazing and a wonderful guitar channel because it's somebody that's very historically um, competent and can go on and tell you all these exciting stories and uh, folklore about certain musicians and certain songs and how they were written and the instruments that they used to do it. And to me, that's like such a cooler way of doing it. So I almost feel like I know him as a person. Whereas if I watch somebody like um, Martin Miller, I'll just name Martin Miller because he doesn't demo gear. He doesn't do any of that, but he's, he's strictly a performer on YouTube. He's amazing. The medleys that him and his band do, they're outstanding, but I don't feel any connection to him. Like I'll always watch his videos, but I don't feel anything when I'm watching it. It's just like, yeah, it's just an awesome band and an awesome performer. You know, and it's a little bit different to somebody like Greg Cock, who I feel like I know his personality. Again, another example of I mm. almost feel like I, if I could sat down with the guy in the same room, we could easily just sit and I have no problem making a conversation with him. And I feel like that's something that's also lost and something where, you know, you have to cater to getting clicks and getting this and that or whatever, whether it's YouTube or Instagram or TikTok, God forbid. Yeah, I, I can't do that. <laughs> with I, I'm with you. But I, I don't know. I feel like you're kind of in a, it's it's a tough decision to make because you, you know everybody at the end of the day that does a creative field wants to be able to make a living off of it and i don't yeah. feel like you should feel bad about that but at the same time you have to appreciate everyone's going to have their different ways of doing it some people will be able to compromise with themselves so to speak in order to do that and yeah like i'm i'm just happy where i'm at with it and i'm again i'm i'm really happy that people to connect with it at the level that they do because it was not expected, you know. It's a happy accident. Yeah, you, I, I almost made I almost made a joke that would have if my wife had listened to this, I would have gotten in big trouble. So I'm oh. not gonna. Do, I'm, not gonna <laughs> I'm just I'm just kidding. I, I I love my daughter even though it was it was not something that we had immediately planned on to at the time. But before we go, because I know it's getting close to that time that you're going to have to go and change some nappies. I wanted to ask you, you get you, you get five things here. Now, you've already yeah. kind of answered one of them, all right? Yeah. Now, this is going to be an ongoing thing. So anybody who comes onto this, onto the future, they're going to get the same things. Your first question I'm going to ask you, what is your favorite musical memory? And when I say that, it doesn't need to be something where you were playing. It could be a song you were listening to at a certain moment or anything like that. Or it could be, you know, just the first time you learned a song or anything like that. What's your favorite? Favorite musical moment? Well, I just have to have to do some digging because there have been quite a few in my life. Mm-hmm. Um, favorite musical moment? Maybe it's uh, the toss up between two things. I think one yeah. one was the um, I think just just a, a memory which is a bit of a blur of uh, car trips with my parents playing a cassette of Paul Simon's Graceland, like a lot of eighties young parents must have. 
Yeah. You know, and I think, uh, yeah, that's probably got me interested in music at that very impressionable young age. Second time I was, and this is made, that's more recorded music. This is more live music. I think seeing Leonard Cohen live in his final tour or in his final years, uh, that was, I mean, I've, you know, as I said, I'd, uh, when I played acoustic, I, I played a lot of folky sort of stuff and Leonard Cohen. I like playing a few of his songs and just seeing those songs performed live by this, I think he was a septuag- septuagenarian who was probably more more active and more agile on stage than people like half his age. That was just an, an amazing concert. And and those songs just had so much power, power live. And he had a real connection with the audience as well. And um, yeah, just someone I, I would always admire after that. So uh, a real, real hero of mine um, as a as, as a songwriter, Leonard Cohen. Okay, so question. That's two. a good. Those are those are good answers right there. I mean, I, and don't feel bad if you have more than one kind of answer to any of these questions. Feel free. Like I said, this is all free form at this point. So yeah. the second question. Everybody asks about desert island stuff as far as gear and all that. I'm not interested in that. I'm interested to know. You're on a desert island. You can oh, yeah. only have one meal for dinner every oh. night. What is it? God. See, I'm the one, as I probably said in the Discord, I'm the one who does the cooking around the house. <laughs> so, yeah. So, I love cooking my favorites, although I, I like using chili, and uh, unfortunately, the wife doesn't have as strong a constitution as I do. Mm-hmm. So, I tend to have a lot of habaneros and scotch bonnets sitting in the freezer. Uh, probably um, a Jamaican curry oxtail. Very spicy indeed. Good. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I I didn't think you were going to say that. You, you were starting to mention habaneros and some other stuff. Yeah, and I was just like, oh, I'm like, oh, he's he would fit right into Southern California, or at least where I was living in San oh, Diego. Yeah. So that was yeah, really funny. Um, no, I did. I actually went, remember going to a few places. Rubio's Fish Tacos. Ring a bell? Yes. Yes, yeah. of course. <laughs> what a small world. It is. All right, so I can cross one off, cross two off. Okay, here's yeah. another. You know, I'm going to get you with one of the music question here, and then I'll get into the other ones. So, sure. if you could have – money is no object. Yeah. You can have any one piece of gear. What would it be? Money was no object. One piece of gear. Hmm. Probably at this stage, a nice uh, hand-wired uh, Fender amp at this present moment in my playing. Course, Any in particular? I don't know, maybe, maybe a deluxe reverb, maybe a twin, something like that. Um, money being no object. Uh, vintage gear. Uh, I don't know, the, the little champ that... Uh, Eric Clapton played his Layla solos through. Mm. Might be a nice little relic to have. See, you're you're reasonable. You know, you, you'll actually be able to afford one of those one day because those <laughs> are still not that expensive. It's not to the point where yeah. if you wanted a Telecaster from that era, it's going to cost you a car. Yeah. One of those old champ amps, you're not going to pay anywhere near that. So that, that that's good. That's good for you. That's good for you all. That's good for your wife because it's a very good sell at that point. Be like, look, look how much this would cost. Be like, the champ amp, that's not that bad. A bit limited in what you can play, but really a very, very sweet tone, I'm sure. But it, it nails what it's good at. And I prefer that too. I'd rather have the one piece of gear sometimes that's just, it's awesome at one thing and one thing only. It kind of, you have to lean into its strengths at that point. So next, I wanted to ask you, you can live, no, you're, you're forced to live in one foreign country. What would it be? God, forced to live in one foreign country? If I was forced, if I was... Uprooted from my very comfortable little little life here, down here, the yes. arse end of the world. <laughs> Where would I go? Where would I go? <sighs> Probably the UK. Probably London. I mean, look, I, I visited London. I was, I'd always thought that either, look, I, I did grow, do a bit of growing up uh, in other countries. I was born in South Africa. I 
lived in New Zealand for a lot of my youth. I came to Australia 11 years ago, married an Australian girl, have an Australian child. I'm here for the long term. But, uh, you know, the, the UK, I, there was a time when I think I had left school and I thought, God, I can't wait to move to London. I'll go and write for the music press, you know, NME, Mojo or whatever. I can be be <laughs> like my be like my heroes, you know, Nick Kent or whatever. Um that didn't happen. Okay. Just uh, real life got in the way of my dreams. And to be honest, uh, music journalism, I don't think is what it's, what it used to be even since the early two thousands. So, but London, I really, I really enjoyed, enjoyed England, you know, maybe living there might be a different story. You know, I hear the cost of living, the cost of living in London, I can, I can imagine would be bloody terrible. Um, you know, there's never an hour goes by at night when you don't hear a siren. Mm. And there's just this really interesting smell about the place as well. <laughs> you know, I think I think someone, there is. someone I think someone described it. I don't know if you've you haven't, you haven't been to London. Not to London, no. But no, I, you, I, I I know the musky smell from a few other places I've traveled in the world. No, that's it. It's like a very musky smell of like old cigarette and beer, spilt beer. You know, it's like a big pub. It's a big mm. open air pub. You know, which can be great to visit. To live, maybe not so much. Um, I wouldn't mind visiting again, though. Yeah, you reminded me of a place um, when when I went to Spain, and when I spent a few days in Valencia, it was like that. There was like this whole little street (laughs) where it just had it because everyone still smoked, and it was it's still very common there. It wasn't as you know modernized as uh, Madrid or Barcelona, so it was it definitely had the musk. It was just it felt old. And it reminded me a lot of of, New, of certain spots in New York City where I used to be taken by my father to all the Italian areas and stuff like that. So I, I totally relate to what you're talking about with that musk smell. So you get to pick three albums to listen to for the rest of your life, and that's it. What are they? Okay. Ooh. Um, again, all-time favorites. My top three. I haven't changed all that much, to be honest, over the last 20 years. My favorite album of all time. Uh, do you want to have a guess of what it might be? <laughs> I have no Fleetwood Mac rumors. <laughs> nah, look, it's, it's just, again, I don't hate that album. I just think that it's too slick. But my favorite album of all time is Hounds of Love by Kate Bush. Really? You've heard that album? No, I, I've not. But that, that that took me very off because of the way that this conversation has gone. Yeah. I, I was I was going to lean towards the Paul Simon. And Graceland is it's Graceland is probably in my top 20 somewhere. But okay. uh, that album in particular, um, I don't think there's an electric guitar on it. I think it was all done on a fair light. Uh, you know, those one of those old 80s um, keyboards uh, samplers. Mm-hmm. You know, it's. Um, if you have an opportunity to listen to it, please do. It's it's a very just a lot of everything I liked in music over two sides of of, of a record. It's just full of passion. Um, she, as an artist, I'm I'm still in awe of Kate Bush. She she can do anything. She can do anything. Um, brave the theatricality of the album. I tend to like, given that I like subtle things. That brand of theatricality uh, is is something that I that, that I really admire. Um, it's just really an artist who's so unafraid to take risks, Kate Bush, or at least in, in her prime. Uh, second favorite album is, um, you probably heard, have heard of this one, I Want to See the Bright Lights Tonight by Richard and Linda Thompson. That I've heard. Yeah, okay. That's um, That was my first real exposure to Richard Thompson. And as a guitar player and a songwriter, I don't think he's really equaled, in my opinion. He still releases fantastic albums. But that album, I think it was released in 1974. Uh, the way he he plays, he plays almost like his guitar, like it's a wind instrument, like like pipes. He's like playing northern pipes, pipe reels on, 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 on his Stratocaster. And then there's a particular song called The Calvary Cross on, on that album. And that opening guitar salvo, it's almost like you, you can see where Johnny Greenwood of Radiohead got a few ideas. Mm-hmm. You know, this very jagged, almost discordant guitar line, which is still just a real 
uh, I'm just in awe of his playing. Third album, this tends to change. Uh, I probably would have said for a long, long time, um, uh, The Queen is Dead by The Smiths. <clears throat> and perhaps it still is. Um, but I think... Um, I don't know, maybe that one. Songs of Leonard Cohen, perhaps, the first Leonard Cohen record. Um, you see, that, that, those first two albums are fairly solid in, in, in the first and second place. Uh, the rest of the list sort of fluctuates now that I think about it. So, um, you know, uh, I like all sorts. Yeah. Right, I'll, leave, I'll let you have the Smiths. That's the that, that's the easy way out here on that one. It's it, as as popular as that album is or has become over the years. Yeah. It's it's popular for a reason, so it makes sense. I, I, I love Johnny. I, I love Johnny. Mark. Yeah, perfect it, it, encapsulation it, it, of everything that made the Smiths great. I think is on that album. I don't think they did a they put a foot wrong anywhere, but I think that particular album as a, a as a statement. I think that is the Smiths. Okay, your last question. This is an easy one. Yeah. Now, I don't know if you're an Oasis fan, but yep. who would you prefer, Liam or Noel? Oh, bloody hell. Probably Noel, because you can actually have a conversation with him. <laughs> 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 oh, Liam, what does he do? He just slurs and, you uh, know what I mean? You uh, know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that or he'll start fighting with you. Uh, yeah, he just... He's a real rock star. There's absolutely no doubt about that. But uh, yeah. ah, man, and great! He had a great voice in his prime, and he's, he's still yeah. going. He's still trying to write some songs. But I always find it interesting to see where people side with, because it, it's surprisingly a lot more split with non-guitarist. If I were to ask that same question, I always get a different yeah. answer. But it's something I find fascinating because I love Oasis, and you know, most people know Oasis, whether or not they they, they play an instrument yeah. or not. So, so, All right, so I mean, those first two albums, brilliant. No, 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 no. You know, I would even go as far as to say uh, the third one had moments that were still brilliant on it. Yeah. I think oh, you're they right. went, I think they leaned a little too far into the Beatles for the third one. Oh yeah. Oh but, yeah. It was like uh, every nook and cranny. You look, there's a. A reference in the song, even in the videos. I mean, uh, was it yeah. all around the world? Yellow submarine for the nineties. <laughs> yeah, and it, it was, it was awkward. It got to the point where it was, it was distracting. But yeah. as a whole, I thought the third album. What, a lot of people they they gave it the Pinkerton treatment to 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 yeah. some degree. They said that you know this this is terrible. Just stick to what's the story, Morning Glory, and all that. But no, or don't you know be here now. But that uh, that album, I like it the older I get, I believe. But I, I also like a lot of their demo material, too. I think a lot of the, there was a lot of gems. If you ever heard the original demos of some of these songs that made it onto those popular albums, I almost find them more endearing because it's just so raw. And I, I really I, yeah. I appreciate that. Oh. Okay, so. But, yeah, Didn't no, you? so I had a lot of fun doing this. You know what? I, I think I'd like to do this again with you if you would be so interested in joining me and, and gracing me with your presence on a future episode of something like this because I, I this is one thing. This is There's no other way of saying this. With Dave, everything, he's so into the modern end of things. So I feel very lost in a lot of conversations about music because – he brings up a lot of things that I, I I'm not familiar with and I can't really expound on it. But when it comes to talking about, you know, the older stuff and specifically, you know, just the real appreciation for the full albums and the singer songwriter stuff, I, I, there's not many people that I can have that conversation with. And I feel like this is something that I would love to continue to talk to you with about more given, you know, the scheduling is kind of working out a little bit here. I know it's late yeah. for you. It's, it's either going to be really late for me and really early for you or really early for me and late for you. It's just the way that the times work out. But I'd like to thank you for taking the time to do this. And, you know, again, for all your support, this has been, it's been a lot of fun. Absolutely. No problem at all. All right, everybody. So this is where I'm going to turn off the video as far as the podcast goes. I hope that you enjoyed this. And Ian, I'm looking at you. You are next on this list. So, 
I, ho- I hope you're ready, but I'm going to give you a few, maybe I'll throw in a few curveball questions for you because you're the kind of person that would prepare too much. And I know you're going to listen to this. So the rest of you, thanks for checking this out. I'll see you tomorrow for a different video. Take it easy.